Hello, and welcome to the webinar, The Rise of Earned Media, why PR and Earned is ready to secure its rightful place in the marketing mix. My name is Philip Smith. I'm the head of news and content at Gorkana, and I'm delighted to be moderating today's webinar. In this webinar, we're going to look at the modern marketing mix and specifically the range of media available to marketeers and communicators and where earned media, including PR, fits in. I'm delighted to say that joining me on the webinar to help us understand this and some of the issues involved in their implications for PRs and communicators are Patrick Barrett, founder and MD of Sympatico PR and a former editor of Media Week, and Tom Ritchie, product director of Cision EMEA. I'll introduce Patrick and Tom properly in a moment, but before that, let me refresh you all on some of the subjects that they're both going to be looking at in this webinar. We all know, almost to the point of cliche, that it's a complex media and marketing world. One way of looking at this world is seeing media as paid, owned, and earned. Paid, or in other words, advertising. Owned, a brand's own channels and websites. And earned, which is PR and editorial media. And where social media fits in, I guess, is anyone's guess. Uh, I actually might challenge both our guests to explain that in a minute. But seriously, the three forms of media face different challenges, and we're going to look at some of those challenges today. On one hand, brands which rely on advertising and other forms of paid media are suffering from competition and consumer indifference in some cases. On the other hand, earned media, particularly editorial content, is growing in importance. Just look at the importance of a business's reputation now, or even the reputation of its CEO. The challenges for paid media models, from ad blocking to video viewability stats, but also in the past, PRs and communicators have suffered from also not having the right tools and techniques at their fingertips. And in this webinar, we want to show how they might understand those different aspects of paid, owned, and earned media, and how they're contributing to their overall campaign success. So three areas we'll look at are challenges to paid, owned, and earned media challenges, the changing media landscape, and how brands are combining earned and paid channels for success. So it's a big subject. And as I said, we've got two media experts, Tom and Patrick, with us, and they've both got different backgrounds and expertise to help us debate it. Tom is Tom Ritchie, Product Director, EMEA at Cision. He joined Cision in 2002 and spent eight years in various roles, including leading the UK's customer services and sales divisions and European product development organization, before becoming the Managing Director of the Cision UK business in 2012. In 2014, Tom relocated from London to Chicago, where he led the global product team, driving innovation and defining the product strategy as SVP of product management. After the acquisition of Gorkana, Tom returned to the UK to focus on driving the European product roadmap and focus on evolving decisions analysis and monitoring services. His international perspective, combined with direct sales, services and marketing leadership experience, and a deep understanding of decisions market and products, play an integral role in creating the ultimate technology to power Gorkana's client stories. Patrick is Patrick Barrett, founder and MD of Sympatico PR. Patrick is a communications and media expert with more than two decades experience in PR and journalism. As founder and managing director of Sympatico PR, Patrick has first-hand experience of the challenges faced by business startups, in particular developing a compelling and differentiated proposition in a crowded market. Since launching in January 2012, Sympatico PR, based in London, Soho Square, has grown rapidly. It boasts a portfolio of international businesses and exciting startups in design, media, technology, research, and marketing. The agency offers a fusion of media relations and content services and an integrated approach that can fuel earned, owned, and paid content strategies. Patrick began his career as a journalist covering retail, FMCG, financial services, motoring, advertising and marketing for titles such as Guardian, Marketing Magazine, Broadcast, and Supermarketing Magazine. He was editor of Media Week magazine for six years during seismic changes created by the first dot-com boom and the subsequent bust and the digitization of media. Tom, Patrick, welcome to the webinar. Hello. Hello. And I have to say, actually, having mentioned that Patrick is a former editor of Media Week, I should declare myself that I was one of his I almost said many, actually. I think it was two or three successors of Editor of Media Week. Uh, and I better also declare that Tom, to my knowledge, hasn't edited what was the preeminent media title in the UK. Uh, <laughs> seriously, seriously, though, I'm delighted to have Tom and Patrick join us today. Um, 
Tom is going to set the scene for the debate with a presentation in a second. Um, and his presentation, after 20, 25 minutes or so, um, at the end of that presentation, I'm going to kick off a question and answer session with both Patrick and Tom. I've got questions for them both, uh, but we would all love to hear what you all have to say and to ask them. So please use the question panel on the right hand side of your screen um, and send in your questions and help me put Tom and Patrick on the spot. Um, as I said, that will be after the, Tom's presentation, but do, do send us your questions as soon as you want to, and I will make sure there's time at the end of the webinar to get them answered. Gosh, that's more than enough from me. Tom, please start your presentation. Well, thanks very much for that, and uh, thank you to everyone who's joined us today. Um, so I'm, I'm keen to kind of talk about uh, where, where we're going really as an industry and, and where I think uh, 2016 has, has led to quite a big shift uh, in the importance of, of earned media uh, and the, in the overall communication cycle. And, and I, I mentioned 2016 because I think it's, it was a, a critical year, I think, in, in changing the way that people uh, view trust uh, in some of the more traditional uh, speakers and commentators and celebrities that we see uh, out there in, in, in the world today. Uh, and I won't mention specifics uh, because obviously uh, I don't want to be insensitive, uh, but I think you all know what I refer to uh, when, I, when I refer to those changes in 2016. And I think, you know, for brands, trust is one of those uh, absolutely critical things that need to be considered uh, when viewing your overall communications campaigns. And I just wanted to share to begin with uh, the results of the Edelman uh, Trust Barometer, uh, which I think is uh, a really good way of understanding uh, where audiences today go to, to to get their relied on and trusted sources of information. Um, and I think, you know, there's no surprises that, that all of us uh, really kind of depend on friends and family and people we know uh, to, to understand, uh, you know, what, what sources they should trust. Uh, but I think for those working uh, in earned media, uh, we continually see uh, those academics, those analysis, those analysts and journalists are regularly featuring so high uh, in that, that trust barometer. You know, we know today that you, know, you, you will go to uh, those, those, those sources, those trusted, uh, relied on sources of information uh, to get impartial opinion, to get a, a view uh, that will inform uh, your, your opinions of brands uh, and various opinions. Uh, I find it fascinating as well seeing celebrity continues to decline uh, in, in the uh, the trust barometer, and really, you know, for brands trying to uh, get their brand messaging across, uh, that are potentially a brand that's not being used by someone today, uh, companies that are not used uh, by people uh, really feature quite low on, on that trust uh, barometer. I think when we kind of break that down even more, and, and I've kind of categorized these, uh, these uh, kind of areas uh, from, the, from the Nielsen report seen into, at the top, what I would consider those those things that earned media professionals can influence, uh, those that appear in red are those uh, more kind of owned channels, uh, and those pay channels uh, kind of in, in blue and green. And I've separated the blue and green because I, you know, I remember five years ago when we were all talking about kind of how viral ads was the way to go, and you know, it was, it was clearly a, a great way for paid uh, to invest in, in getting their message out. You know, more and more increasingly, we're seeing people have less and less trust uh, as those as as sources of information that they can really rely on. Um, and you know, we're still seeing uh, those things featuring so high up, editorial content in particular, uh, featuring high in those places where people go uh, to get their, their sources of information. And I will be intrigued to see uh, with, with the advent of fake news and kind of what we're seeing on, on Twitter and Facebook in the last, uh, and again, in 2016, uh, where those will start to, to erode and, and feature uh, when, we're, when we're looking at these stats uh, in, the, in the next report. And I think, you know, it comes as no real surprise, I think, to many of us that actually advertising is just having less and less impact uh, on people's buying-making decisions. Uh, you know, in a recent survey of Forrester, uh, you know, 88% of consumers were saying that advertising really had very little influence on their buying-making decision. When they're deciding what they're going to invest in, uh, you know, th those adverts, of course, they, you know, they feature and they, they do have an impact in, in the, the overall perception of a brand. Uh, but in the actual making a decision, the actual moving into to separating uh, yourself from your money and buying uh, from a brand, uh, increasingly advertising has had less impact. And I think that's a, that's a situation that's exacerbated uh, and, and helped uh, in, in lots of ways uh, by technology. 
Um, and I, I, I would love to uh, uh, do a survey with the audience that we have uh, on the line today to see just how many people uh, this resonates with. I've, I've uh, put this slide up a few times, uh, and I get a very different response depending on the country I'm in and depending on the demographic of, of people that I'm, that I'm talking to. Um, but I think you know, this is a, a piece of research done on the, the Global Web Index that looked at people using ad blocking software on their you know, the, the, the sheer number of people that aren't considering it, that it hasn't kind of come into their purview and isn't something that they, they are actively doing, being at just 21% is staggering. That means you know, a huge percentage of us are already actively using ad blocking software and many, many more are, are, are seriously considering uh, uh, using that type of technology, those paid ways of, of, of pushing out um, brand message. I think as well, you know, I, uh, and I think I'm, I'm, I, I used to think I was a little unusual in this way, but I think there's more and more people like me today. Uh, you know, I don't own a terrestrial television in my house. Um, the, the, you know, I, I watch Netflix, I watch iPlayer, uh, other streaming services are available. Uh, and I find myself, the only time I actually watch an advert uh, is when my daughters feature in them because they are uh, actresses. But I think, you know, that, that is another great example of where technology is making it uh, easier and easier for people to avoid uh, those advertising messages. Now we turn that on its head and we look more at kind of earned media. Um, the Ansel survey, uh, which we commissioned in 2016, um, kind of asked senior marketeers and, and communicators uh, where they felt, felt the value was uh, with earned media. And there was a resounding result of 80% of the people surveyed said that earned media was as effective or more effective uh, than paid media. And you know, when we're talking about uh, earned media, these aren't strange, new, fangled ideas. These are things that people have been doing for many, many years. And I think when you look across the, uh, the size of organizations as well, uh, the bar on the, in, on the right is, is the large corporation organizations, and, and on the left, the smaller. You know, people, no matter what size organization, they are doing earned media activity today. Um, and they're things that we're so familiar with, you know, press releases, seeding story ideas. These are things that people do every single day. So we end up with this slightly odd paradox um, that, that kind of looks at how much people are prepared to invest uh, in, in uh, the, the earned and paid spaces. And it, it's directly inverted. If you look at uh, typical budgets, and I a very close friend I was having a dinner with on Sunday who, who works in uh, paid, uh, was, we were talking about uh, an account that we, we both share uh, independently from each other. And the, the amount of money invested in that account with, with the agency that he works for, uh, was significantly larger. And so, you know, this, these bars are not proportionate to the, uh, the investment. But again, when, when, I when I've showed this slide previously uh, to, to, to organization CMOs uh, that really look at their overall mix, they, they all nod their heads, and you know, hopefully this resonates with the audience as well. So really, we, we know from these sources that consumer trust, uh, a lot of that trust is put into earned media and the recommendations. And yet, conversely, it's, it, it achieves the least amount of, of budget and the least amount of investment. So the question, am I, uh, am I saying that actually paid media is, is crazy, uh, everyone should take that paid spend and shift it over into earned? Well, no, because it's not a magic bullet. Um, and I think the reality is that, yes, there, there is more, I think, that could be done around, around earned. But the reality is, and, and you know, if you're looking at targeting different demographics, if you're looking at targeting uh, different geographies as well, each of these different ways of sending out your message, each of these, these tactics that can be used in earned and paid and owned will resonate differently with different audiences in different markets. And so really the, the, the message that I'm trying to get across is that converged media really is, is the kind of new reality uh, that I feel more and more as I, as I talk to CMOs and, and large organizations that this is becoming something that people are, are much more aware of, much more cognizant of, and really they need to make sure that their messages are joined up across whatever spectrum, whatever medium that they're pushing out, and really it's about using that mix of tools to address the audience that they're trying to address. And you know, this was uh, you know, a piece of uh, words on my altimeter in, in 2012. Uh, where they, they, they kind of first proposed this, this concept of, of converged media. And I think it, it's becoming more and more a reality. And, and, and the truth is we need to be far more responsive, far more aware of what's working, what's not working, uh, and where we need to invest and, 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 and put our efforts 
uh, across all of the paid, owned, and earned uh, media spectrums. Now, I think we, we're also uh, in an interesting world at the moment where uh, paid and owned uh, as, as kind of industries, if you like, have really seen dramatic investment and evolution uh, over the last well, 10 years, frankly. And I think, you know, if you look at some of the marketing clouds that are out there today, the likes of Adobe, the likes of Marketo, uh, Oracle, you know, they have already done a, a huge amount of investment uh, and you know, bringing together of best-in-class point solutions uh, and aggregating them together into cloud solutions. Uh, and I think yeah, the same is true uh, when we look at uh, some of the more kind of pay channels as well, particularly when we're talking digital, particularly when we're, we're looking at online. And I think you know these these two kind of giant clouds have have brought together data in a way that people have never been able to access data before. And I think you know the thing that that allows these teams to do when they're when they're looking at uh, getting spend and, and investing budget, and I feel that they are moving really from cost centers uh, into revenue generating centers. You know you can directly attribute that last click to somebody going and buying a product from your site. And, and you can put very real, you know, if I spend one pound here, I know I get one pound 80 back, I'm gonna spend two pounds. And what do you know, you can, you can really turn the dial uh, and, and, and invest in, in where you want to drive uh, those changes. And I think it's time now for, for earned to take that leap. I think, you know, there has been consolidation uh, in the industry in the 20 odd years that I've, I've been working in this industry. But really, there's, there's never been a kind of uh, a, a giant leap uh, in really wanting to make sure that there is a cloud solution that really delivers uh, in the same way that those, uh, that those owned and uh, paid clouds bring together data and put it all into one place. And I, I won't go um, too much into the detail of what we're doing uh, today because this is a, a more wider discussion. But we have uh, embarked on a journey of really doing very similar things than those uh, that the, the marketing clouds have done in really bringing together the best point solutions uh, that we can see, not just uh, you know in a specific uh, market, but really kind of taking that global view uh, and bringing together uh, the best in class and putting them into one solution. And that solution, I think, when we when we talk to to our customers and, and, and to, to clients and prospects. Uh, you know, these are, are common problems that we hear uh, resonating, uh, that, that people are having to face every single day. And I think for a lot of communicators who work in, in the earned space, you know, so much of what people do day to day is, is, uh, is manual, so little is predictive. Um, if you think about, you know, today where you're you know, building a, a media list, that media list needs to be looked after, it needs to be managed, you need to make sure you're staying on top of the the, the, the people that are in that list, understanding that are they still interested in, in what I'm talking about? Uh, and it really, you know, it, it, it's consuming, it's time consuming. And as we all know, you know everyone is, is more and more time constrained uh, in doing what they need to do. And I think what, what we're keen to do, and I think what we, we hear more and more, uh, is that people need solutions that are predictive, uh, things that are looking for trends, understanding behaviors, uh, and recommending, uh, you know, and doing a lot of the kind of heavy lifting uh, so that people in earned can really you know, specialize on the, on the things that they do best, uh, which you know, creating that great content and building those great relations. Um, I think as well, the other, the other big thing that we need to do, and you know, we've seen this uh, clearly work in, in, the, in the marketing clouds, is, is bringing these siloed buckets of data together so that coll collectively uh, you're able to draw uh, great insights from all of, that, all of that data together in one place. And, you know, we're working with, uh, with a couple of really uh, forward-looking, uh, innovative uh, companies today uh, who use our platforms. But frankly, it's not the platform that they're excited about. It's the aggregation of that data and that putting that data alongside the other data that they've got from their Google Analytics, from their Marketo, their sales data that they've got from, from Salesforce, and really being able to have a proper 360 view and, and ultimately to be able to attribute uh, value to the different activities uh, that people are doing across uh, that entire spectrum. And really kind of the, the, the final thing that, that we, uh, we are passionate about and we, we hear you know, time and time again is that people uh, in you know, communicators in, in earned really want to be able to link back uh, this data to their organizational objectives. Uh, you know, they are doing these things for very real data. Obviously, lots of companies want to build revenue and, and you know, improve EBITDA. That's, that's, that's 
a given, but you know, changing brand perception, uh, reaching audiences that you've not previously reached before. These are objectives that actually, when you have all of this data and you have it in one place and you can bring it all together, uh, you can link back to those organizational objectives uh, that you have. And so really, you know, kind of what, what we're doing and, and what we're, we're, we're seeing the industry moving towards and, and we're deeply passionate about creating, uh, it really is a, a kind of tool that, that brings together the best of uh, influencer data, not just the kind of traditional hand curated, uh, trusted data that, that, that many people come to us today and, and, and trust, but augmenting that with, with technology and with insights, uh, helping people create great news content, uh, and really kind of putting insights and analytics on top of that. Uh, Phil mentioned earlier about kind of where social fits in, uh, and I hope we get to tackle that question later on. Uh, but you know, engagement tools, uh, you know, when you're looking at the, the type of solutions that people uh, need to be not only listening to the conversation, but engaging in the conversation, uh, being able to engage in real time uh, is such a critical thing today. Uh, you know, we all know how to do it very easily, uh, you know, on, on social platforms, but it's about having that 360 view across all the different uh, media types that's so key. And of course, distribution networks are so key as well today. You know, uh, obviously, you know, with, with uh, PRN being a part of our, our family, we have a, a, you know, a great trusted wire network. People obviously use a, a great deal of uh, email distribution. But you know, all of the social channels that we're now able to integrate uh, and to help people connect through Pinterest, through Instagram, through Facebook, through Twitter, you know, these are all ways, these are all tools that people need to, to have at their disposal to get their message out to the right audience in the right way that resonates with them. And of course, putting it all together in a, a simple, easy to use platform is, is uh, something that we're, we're very passionate about. And as I say, it's not really just about the, the kind of the tooling, it's really about connecting that in. It's about plugging that data, uh, that earned data, in alongside the own data and, and, and the paid data that really will allow people to get a true reflection and move upstream from the, the last click that's currently getting all the kudos for the conversion of a sale right the way back to the original outreach that somebody had uh, with a journalist that started that awareness, that started that conversation, uh, that ultimately led that consumer to their final decision-making uh, stage, clicking on the website and, and acquiring and buying the product. So to sum it up, really, I think you know I, we believe passionately that the, the future of, of where we're going is truly integrated communication, uh, really consistent messaging across uh, all of the different campaigns and all of the different uh, media assets that people use today, um, and really kind of bringing all of that together and having that data uh, where people can interrogate it uh, in a single place. And with that, I'll hand back over to you. Thank you, Tom. Um, th that brings two points to mind. Before I bring um, Patrick into the conversation, and I have a range of questions for Patrick, but um, I do want to make sure that we answer your questions as well. So do send in your questions uh, about paid, owned, and earned, and whether earned has its rightful place, and how it, we can ensure it has its rightful place, uh, by using the question panel on the right-hand side of your screens. And we, we'd love to see what you think uh, and any questions that you have for Tom and Patrick. I think the second thing I'll say also is um, there was a lot of data there. Thank you, Tom, on those slides. Uh, we'll be making those slides available after the webinar. Uh, and actually also, I suspect we'll need to reprise this webinar at least within the next 12 months because there were a few predictions there and a few trends that we want to see if they were really true and will be answered in, in the next few months. So, um, so keep your eyes peeled for that. Um, so Patrick, and Patrick, you, you, you're um, now obviously running and owning a, um, a PR company. Uh, you're a former journalist, former editor of Media Week, which, is, which actually was a publication all about paid media and commercial media. Um, so going through that sort of journey and just in general, how has your view of paid, owned, and earned media changed in the last few years? Um, and this pace of change we've been talking about, has that increased as well? I think the first thing to say is that anyone of my generation has probably just become so used to living through continuous media revolution and technology revolution that it's uh, yet another thing to think about. Um, so, you know, it's worth just rewinding slightly and going, well, what has happened over the last 25 years that, um, that has taken us to this point and, and, and think about maybe where it goes. But, you know, there are three, in my mind, there are three big things that are really, really interesting. Obviously, the, the profound one is uh, going from a, a situation 
in the late 80s, early 90s, where there was really a very, very limited amount of media to play with. It, there wasn't much. Um, and, and most brands could get away with broadcasting their messages to mass media and, and, and have fairly simplistic strategies. Um, and of course, that's completely changed. We now have a vast array of media. It's continuous. It's 24-7. We're now seeing geographical boundaries um, being t turned down. You know, most media is now international. You know, have to look at the drum this week saying it's launching a global magazine. Um, social media has obviously created this enormous feedback loop um, and has, has radically changed the way that uh, businesses and brands need to talk to audiences. Um, and what it means is that the flow of influence and opinion is continuous and never ending. So there's that to say. Um, and that's changed the way people behave as well. People um, are more informed, uh, they know more, uh, the world is more transparent, they trust people less, they trust businesses less, that's the upshot of it. Um, so, you know, you know, they're more sophisticated, they're more difficult to work with. Um, so there's a lot going on in, just in that one point. And then you've got this amazing opportunity that's, that's been created, a sort of effective democratization of media, if you like, where any company can become a media owner. Um, and, you know, it's taken a long time, I think, for businesses to really get their heads around that fact. I think a lot of businesses, businesses still struggle with it. Um, but it's an amazing opportunity. Um, and some companies are now doing it extremely well. Um, but a, a lot have a lot to learn, and they need to think about it a little bit differently. And of course, social media is a big part of that, and, and um, you know, a, and a very challenging part of it too. And then there's this third bit, which which is even newer, which is the fact that we are um, living through an age of disruption. Technology is changing pretty much every business sector you care to think of. Every company now has to start thinking of them, themselves as a digital company. Um, Business models are being disrupted. The pressure to innovate is really acute on businesses and brands, whether in a B2B context or a consumer context. Um, and what that means is, is that businesses and brands are under constant pressure to innovate, to have a, a consistent profile, to say interesting things to audiences, and to prove that they're ahead of the curve and that they are ultimately relevant. So, on one side, I see um, technology being this amazing opportunity to, to um, communicate more effectively and to join the dots between um, paid media, your owned media, which has emerged, and earned media too. But it also means that there's incredible pressure to do so. If you don't, you risk being swamped by everybody else's voice because they will talk and they might, you know, nudge you out of out of a conversation. So that's an amazingly complex picture broken down and hopefully into three big things that I, I think have happened and made, makes the world very interesting right now. Absolutely. And with that complex picture, and, and uh, we'll come on to your questions in a minute. I've got a couple more questions for, for Patrick, but please do use the question box to send in your questions for Patrick and Tom. Um, but Patrick, with, with that, that complex picture, do you think that earned media has its rightful place in the marketing mix at the moment? And, and, and why or why not? Well, I think it's very interesting to look at Tom's presentation there and look at that kind of mirror image of spend. Um, and clearly, there is a disconnect going on there. Uh, I think that's really, really, really um, interesting to see. Um, I think it really is a bit of a no-brainer. I know it's challenging, but actually, if you don't start at least considering this, you are frankly putting yourself at a disadvantage. Um, it really is a fairly obvious thing to do. And if you think about um, examples that are out there, um, and there are some very different ones, but if you look at Red Bull, for example, it's an amazing case study for a company that has effectively stopped doing conventional advertising and now almost completely invests in content, and it uses that content in all of these different three ways, um, and it has become effectively a media owner. It's, it's, it's also a drinks brand, obviously, but if you think about it, it's, um, it's a, a media owner that, that owns the extreme sports territory. Um, and they thought laterally about what they could do to enhance the profile and interest in their brand. And so that, that is an amazing consumer case study for how all three can be joined together. However, I, I think it's in the B2B and business world where there is potentially most uh, traction to be gained here. Um, and, you know, we come at it um, from, at Simpatico from an editorial direction. Um, and businesses um, 
lend themselves extremely well to being the source of incredible editorial content and really, really interesting stuff. If they go and look at themselves and mine the expertise of their people, mine the expertise of their product or services, um, and where they're headed as a company, they've got great uh, rich material to, to draw on to build um, um, an integrated program. Um, integrated program, that, that, that leads me very nicely to my next question. I may betray that I, I know something of how you might answer this by saying that um, how do you then achieve truly integrated communications? And, and in your experience, what are the factors that get in your way? I believe you might have a four-point plan for that integration. Four point, yeah. It was three points this morning, but actually I did another one. <laughs> the world is moving out. Hey, well, we, you can't say we, give you, we don't give you value here. Yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah, there are, I mean, broadly speaking, um, it, it is very achievable. It, it seems very complex and challenging, but actually, if you break it down into simple steps, um, it, 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 it can be very achievable. The first thing to say, actually, is that I, I feel where there, there is a disconnect in the three areas is that um, marketing um, teams and agencies tend to do owned and paid uh, marketing programs, and they tend to miss the PR side out. Um, our approach is very much that PR can be the driver, and in fact should be the driver if you have the right kind of skills to do it. Um, so really, we're, we're coming from a PR direction, so that PR can actually drive this process and feed earned first, owned and paid. Why should PR do that? Well, if you think about it, PR people have the skills to question, analyze, and put a piece of content or an idea or a company positioning through the scrutiny of um, how that will be perceived amongst journalists who are you know, obviously looking for credibility, interesting stories, and stuff that's fresh. And they'll, they'll, they'll be right on the, at the cold face of that. And they'll be able to analyze it and, and question whether what uh, the company wants to put out the door is going to work, quite simply, and, have to, and gain traction. So that, that's the first thing to say. Four, four, four ways to do it. But the first bit, really, is to make sure you're clear about what your business objectives are and what you're going to be saying about your company, uh, your brand, what you're, what you're wanting to achieve with that, you know, um, who you're trying to reach. Be really clear about all those um, uh, KPIs and then how you're going to say it and what the key messages are. So that discipline, that communications discipline right at the top is really, really important. Once you've got that nailed, you can then get into what we think is a really fun bit, which is about being creative. Um, so, you know, the, the, the second step really is to go, I need an editorial team or at least a group of people who are equipped to explore my business or explore the, the product proposition or the service that I want to uh, promote, question it, look at how it sits in the world, you know, um, not just within its sector and how it's going to affect people and really, really, really pull it apart and um, give them the freedom to do that. Um, don't forget that you get to set the rules and the parameters when, when that happens. So it's, it doesn't have to be scary. You can set those rules and parameters, but you need to give people freedom to do that, and you need to have the right kind of people to do it as well. Um, the third bit really is those people will hopefully build a body of content or big con content ideas that you can use through, through uh, paid, owned, and earned. Um, but you need to map how you're going to use those um, ideas and against which audience groups, which media, which channels, etc. Um, you know, which which um, which aspect of um, paid are you going to use? Is it search or is it native advertising? Um, so you need to plan it out thoroughly, and you need to connect that with your wider marketing objectives. And then the fourth one, this is the one that I, I almost missed this morning, which is you should curate your content. Think of yourself as a media owner. You should not just use it and throw it away, which so many companies do. Bank it. Use technology to help you do that. Edit it, keep it fresh, reuse it, look at what is going on in the world that can bring it to life again. So think of yourself as a media owner, whether it's video, editorial, or whatever it happens to be, but bank that stuff. It doesn't always have to be visible, but keep it because it will be valuable again down the line. Excellent. Thank you, Patrick. I'm going to ask you one more question before I go to our audience questions because we've got so many of those. That said, um, I'm going to try and make sure there's enough time to get through them all. So if you have any more questions for us, 
do please send them in now. Um, one thing I want to reassure everyone is, at this question and answer stage of the presentation, we don't have any more slides. So don't worry, you're not missing any slides. And we will share the slides from Tom's presentation with you after the webinar. Um, Patrick, I, I just want to ask you, what are, what are the benefits of truly combining paid, owned, and earned media in a campaign for clients? And, and I guess agencies like yourselves, but, you know, what, what would you say to people, this is what you're going to gain if you get this right? Well, I think you have to, you have to remember um, that each area does different things. So, you know, what, what is earned media about? It's about achieving credibility. It's about influencing. It's about positively reinforcing perceptions. It's, it's really powerful stuff. So that's one side of it. Um, owned, what's that about? Well, it's about reinforcement. It's about direct communications. It's about community interaction via social media. And it's also about projecting your culture, which is an area that a lot of business um, are really interested in, in talking about now. Um, and then paid. Well, I mean, you know, it's about extending audience, audience reach. Um, it's pure awareness. It's, um, it's presenting your product to or your brand as, to a, as big an audience as possible. So though, you have to look at each one in a different way, and they all do different jobs. So it would be crazy, really, um, to look at it and not connect the three and make sure that your, um, your, your, your program is, is, is ticking all of those boxes. Excellent. Thank you, Patrick. Um, we shall hear more from you in a, in a minute as we go through the audience questions. And thank you so much, everyone, for sending in those questions. I can see some questions on cost, on budget. Uh, we've got questions even on millennials. Uh, and uh, some things that I, I really like here about uh, communicating the benefits of all this internally and how we might do that. So we're going to try and get through all those questions. Before that, I'm going to start, Tom, by bringing you back into the conversation to ask you a question about, um, I guess, tools and techniques. So this question is, is there a tool by which we can measure the impact of achieving earned content on social? i.e. a story gets picked up by The Guardian and they run it on their FB channel. And further to that, how do you measure and analyze the interaction this has with followers, likes, shares, etc.? So without shamelessly plugging our own uh, <laughs> solutions, um, I, I think, I mean, actually, I'll, I'll pick up one point in there, which I'm sure most people are familiar with, but it's, it's a day-to-day -day challenge that often uh, comes up, and that's really about kind of Facebook uh, and its kind of closed community. Uh, I think you know, we, we do see more and more, particularly on those kind of super public and those, uh, those uh, you know, shared and open uh, Facebook channels, there, there is more and more that we can do with that. Uh, but Facebook, I think, is, is, is quite often a, a challenge uh, for our customers today. And I think, you know, there, there are a number of different solutions that, that can kind of help you understand uh, and really kind of measure the impact and kind of the, the longer tail of uh, influence that you get from, from a piece of uh, content that, that shares uh, on social. Um, I think the I don't think anyone's nailed it yet, though, if I'm totally honest. Uh, I think one of the... The things that we're looking at is really trying to understand uh, where a story is, is kind of watermarked and, and where that ultimately feeds down to. Uh, I think, you know, direct shares of very specific URLs, that's easy to track. And you can track the shares, you can track the likes. Uh, but, uh, you know, for me, what's more important is actually understanding uh, how that story has been interpreted by an individual and how they, they've reshared that maybe in their own words. And that's one of the things we're very excited about. We, uh, data science hours uh, trying to make sure that we can we can nail. Uh, and of course, um, it's probably a good point for me to say that um, if we don't fully answer your question, we 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 have got your email addresses. So um, yes. Tom will certainly keep you informed as that develops. <laughs> I'm sure. Um, now we've got a question here about um, I suppose um, uh, people maybe not getting their priorities right or, or um, missing out on some opportunity. So this question, Patrick, I'll, I'll come to you with this one. Uh, do you think that while many marketing people desire earned media, they push too hard for it to be brand or product driven, i.e. less newsworthy, rather than addressing issues or topics, in brackets, more newsworthy? So do you think that people are pushing the message too hard, I guess is the, is the question, and actually not really making something that relevant? Well, that is a classic um, problem that so many people face. Um, the answer to that is it really depends on um, the scenario, and obviously this scenario does crop up. It's, you know, everyone's faced it, I'm sure. Um, you know, it, it's a bit of an education thing. Sometimes you, you'll work with people who really get it, and they get the fact that if you do that, 
it simply won't work and it won't pass the earned test. You will not get anywhere on that front. And we're just sort of discussing today that that might be the, the biggest opportunity missed. So, um, it, it, you know, how do you tackle that? Um, you know, I, I think honesty and education are the two, two things that sum that up really and being bold enough to uh, challenge senior people on their uh, perceptions of what will and won't work um, and to approach it f from a, a point of view of being a sort of controlled journalistic exercise and getting them to accept that that's what the process is and that it isn't just a simple, right, we've got something we've got to sell and we need some marketing messaging. That's not how it works. So you need to talk to the people who are, you know, in command, if you like, um, if, if they have got a sort of a, you know, a, a, a blinker kind of approach and, and get them to think that way. And whenever we do that, it usually works. And people go, hey, that, that's a really interesting way of looking at it. Actually, that could be, could be quite enjoyable and I get where you're coming from and I understand it. So it is a really challenging and quite typical scenario. I do have to say, though, that we come across that less and less now. I think people are much more sophisticated um, about um, their understanding of how PR and content marketing can work. So, yeah. Okay. Um, on the back of that, there's a there's a question. I'm, I'm going to ask you both a, a cost question in a minute, um, and and what the cost of all this great integrated converged universe is is, and what it what it might mean to a to a client. But before I do that, just following on from that point, Patrick, uh, there's a question here about internal comms and really how you can convince people of the benefits of what you've both just been talking about. So this question is, um, what advice can you give for how I speak about PR and earned media in a way that is relevant and useful for my marketing colleagues, i.e. cutting out all the jargon but helping them appreciate the importance and value of PR activity in line with their own activity? I fear that they still perceive earned media and PR activity as secondary to their own paid and partnership activities. Patrick, what, how, what, what well, advice would you give? You on? know, I, I'll go back to that, that, that chart, you know, that Tom, that Tom yeah. told us. I think, you know, um, I think if you can explain that you can connect the three really, really effectively and treat it as an editorial process, as a creative process, but actually really uh, nailed against the objectives for the business that will do um, what, it, what you're looking for it to do, I think, you know, that's the starting point. Um, and that actually, you know, it can be extremely cost-effective. It can be incredibly powerful for a company. It can fuel entire marketing programs for a year or two years. We've done a campaign working with Accenture Digital and Pure, which is now three years old, and it started with a report, and it has flowed through all the different channels you can imagine, and it's still going. Um, and it started out from a PR point of view, and then has, has flowed, flowed through through um, owned and earned. So. Um, so yeah, it can be incredibly effective. It can create very powerful material for a company or a brand that can be used on an ongoing basis. So there are some very powerful arguments. I would uh, compile as many stats and figures to back that point of view up as I can and, and just explain the process as well. And I think nine times out of 10, you will come up against people who go, yeah, I kind of get that. I can see how it's gonna work. And I understand that the PR media world um, is what it is, but we can use it in a holistic way. So it sounds like like the success there you've been talking about started with a good strong idea that people can understand its impact and where it's going, and that you're reinforcing that by showing when it's successful and explaining that success. Absolutely, absolutely. And you know what, what's lovely is when you get clients who understand that actually starting from an editorial um, uh, process point of view, working with stuff that actually will work um, and interest journalists and then that can be used in so many different channels because you can do it it's there to be done it is great and so I would encourage people to try and educate their, um, their teams about how it can work and how it can be extremely powerful so yeah education is, is definitely part of the challenge I think you know, I think data I mean being a geek I'm always obsessed by data but I think you know really I think that is one of the challenges that we really hear loud and clear and you know this is a this is an everyday uh, challenge. I think you know, the, the marketeers have far more data and far more kind of demonstrable ROI on the things that they're doing. Uh, and it's, it's almost become such a science that, that we, we are lacking, I believe, in, in comparable data that we can pull from earned and share alongside that. And I think you know, that is one of the ways that I think we can, we can start talking a very shared language is, is through data. 
you know, we can start looking at real attribution of, of, of value of the, the various parts of, of campaigns and activities, right the way through from just a raising, you know, original awareness, right the way through to, to, to final click. And I think, you know, and, until we have that data, I, you know, there, there are plenty of people that get it today and, you know, can on, you know, with, with every faith in the world trust that actually, you know, these things will work together. But I think, you know, for, for the, the majority and certainly, you know, CEOs who are clearly very driven by data, you know, they, they have big organizations to run, they, they need to think about what's working, what's not working. We, we need to have that comparable data that we can sit alongside that uh, and attribute in reality and, and, and move away from a lot of the, the vanity metrics. You know, I, I hate to say them, but, you know, yeah. we... Oh, well, I have to say, I completely agree with, with what you're saying, Tom. I think there is a massive gap there. Yeah. And as soon as someone cracks that, the better. So whatever you're working on, hurry up. Um, <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I think absolutely, um, you know, to have be able to come in into the conversation beyond with that kind of information or um, be able to explain how the process works would be amazing. I think um, one of the most exciting potential things down the road is linking editorial with programmatic technology. So obviously, most people be aware about uh, program programmatic advertising right now and how it's Really, that's a very, very um, early stage um, of um, sophistication, but um, it hasn't really that that idea has not really been translated into the editorial space. And when that does happen, which it will, it could be very exciting not only for brands but actually for media owners as well um, and for audiences. I think we then get into a whole area of filter bubbles and stuff like that, but that's a whole other seminar, probably, isn't it? Yeah, it yeah. probably <laughs> is, and I tell you what, we we will flag that up when we come round to our filter bubble seminar or <laughs> webinar. <laughs> Um, now, I'm really conscious of time, so in the next sort of five minutes, we'll try and get through as many questions as possible. Um, the first one, though, uh, that I'll come to you first on this, Tom, and this is about the cost to the client. And I guess um, I guess this can be answered in a couple of ways, but I, I'm going to read the question out, which is basically very simple and to the point, at what cost does all, this all come to the client? And I guess there's another way of looking at this, which is where is the cost to the client as well? So. Tom, what, what, what do you say? This sounds all brilliant, but, but at what cost to the client? Are they bearing the burden? Um, I mean, I, I, I'm trying to think of the question in different ways because you know, are we talking about the direct cost of buying solutions like, like that we're building? I mean, the, the reality is we are technology allows us to do a lot more than we've been able to do uh, uh, before, and at a, more, at a much more kind of cost-effective. Uh, way than, than we've been ever able to do before. So, you know, I think one of the things that we are we're passionate about when we're building uh, the, the technologies and the solutions uh, that we're, we're working on today is, is really to be sensitive to budget and to be able to help people uh, spend where they are able to spend, uh, but also not not spend when they don't need to. Um, and what I mean by that is, you know, again, you know, taking the cloud example of where people have brought together best-in-class solutions. One of the beauties of putting uh, all of the tooling into one place is you can choose where you want to invest more on, and you can choose where to pull back on. So, you know, I, you know, we have a new platform that we've been uh, sharing, sharing with uh, with customers at the moment. And often, when you show them what we can do now, you know, they, they expect it to cost significantly more than it does today. And actually, lots of the things that we can do that, that we've done in the past that have been very expensive, we can now do differently, uh, but in a much more cost-effective way. Um, and so I think, you know, it's a long-winded way of saying, I think, you know, solutions of the future will be much more sensitive to the, the price sensitivity uh, of the, the user of the platform. Uh, and, and we will be able to be more flexible than we've been on being able to offer lots of insight, lots of coding, lots of tagging, sentiment, all of those things which historically have been quite expensive to do. Uh, we can still do it with, with humans and, and have that cost. But we can also now use technology, so so we can help people spend their budgets most effectively. And you know, is it really down to, to cost, or is it really about down to result? And I think you know where we where we see a lot of success is where people uh, are starting to use the technology and get better results by spending less money, and that that actually allows them to invest more and really kind of take some of those pays pounds and dollars and start spending them on earned. Uh, and Patrick, what have you seen when you've done your integrated and more integrated campaigns? You know. That question: At what cost does this all come to the client? Well, I think I think it's a it's a really really important point because um, there might be some uh, businesses out there listening to this who might be small scale and going, "Wow, this sounds really um, like a big challenge and not for me." Actually, you know what? You can do it at a very low level and build it up, and it can be very low cost. It need not cost the earth. Also, I have to say that you know 
um, if you think about it, if you, if you engage with a PR agency, our view is that a PR agency should be able to help you do this, or, or you should be able to bring people into your in-house team who could start developing it at a, not a huge amount of cost. So it's very, very scalable. So you can go from very small scale stuff across each channel to really, really big stuff. And you know, so you can get as Red Bull right at the very top there. You know, huge investment, but it, you can come down to you know a very small budget. And it's just about um, understanding that the opportunity is there and that you can do it at, at whatever level works for you. These are great questions, and I must say I'm, I'm a little frustrated that we're going to be running out of time in a minute. So what I'm going to say to both um, Tom and Patrick is I'm going to ask you uh, to each answer only one or two more questions and to keep those answers as short as possible. Uh, and then, of course, what I'm going to do now is read out the most complicated questions I can find because you've sent in some really detailed ones which have been brilliant. Um, and actually, there's quite a few here that, that have looked at some of the slides that um, Tom has presented. Uh, which, of course, we're going to be sharing after this webinar. Um, so I think the first one is, um, let's look at the, uh, this one. It's interesting to see that journalist voice second only to recommendations from friends and family. Social media question, perhaps a bit off topic. Clickbait seems to be giving online publications and journals a bad name recently, but doesn't appear to be slowing. Should brands be watching and softly implementing best uses of this now if some of the world's biggest sites are? Tom. Interesting. Um, I mean, the whole clickbait thing is something that we need to be uh, kind of conscious of. And I think, I think we still do trust journalists. Voice. I, I go back to the kind of point I made uh, at the start about kind of 2016 being a fascinating year. I do think we are in a state of flux, and I do think uh, that, that, yeah, to, to, to Philip's point, I really welcome doing this this again in 12 months' time and just seeing how much has, has changed. Um, and I, uh, yeah, I think it's, it's a key thing that we do need to be very cognizant of and careful of. Um, and yeah, I, I think it, we'll see how it pans out in 17. Uh, Patrick, I'm going to ask you about in-house PRs now. This, this is a question which uh, is particularly again about that internal um, that internal communication question that we looked at earlier. But this is this is slightly different. In-house PRs need to be better integrated in early stage product planning and pricing alongside their marketing colleagues. Only then will they get the respect and some of the budget of and from the marketing division. Discuss. I don't think we've got time to discuss that. I'd say absolutely. <laughs> right. Well, that, that, that's my short answer. But, but would you like to elaborate? <laughs> you do think that's right? Well, I think that's absolutely right. Now, I think there's, there's you know, it's, it's no question. Um, and I'm sure we're speaking to the converted here. But um, if anyone else is listening, yeah, absolutely should be. Um, and I think that, you know, without that, um, again, companies are missing a trick. Um, and uh, so, yeah, I mean, there's been a lot of debate about the relationship between different elements of marketing, where PR sits in that. And there is probably every scenario under the sun out there in terms of different marketing structures and PR, and corporate communications, et cetera. But really, PR should be at the heart of it and uh, have those kind of dialogues with, with, with marketing people and product development, et cetera, right at the top. Right. Um, Tom, again, another question about one of your charts and one of your slides. The earned media being talked about most is social media, yet on the earlier chart of the most influential and trusted sources of information, social media ranked very low. What other channels of earned media could we quote to internal senior members of staff? I don't think which slide that's referring to. <laughs> I mean, I, I challenge whether social is, is that different from, from mainstream today. I, I think they go so hand in hand together that you know, somebody's social outlet is, is very uh, very linked to their, their, their traditional outlet. So you know bloggers, you know they'll, they'll have a social voice. They will have uh, they will have their traditional uh, media voice. Uh, I think it's really kind of all joined up. Um, I mean, I, I, I'd, I'd be interested to get the email address and. Uh, Yes, we'll do that. We'll, yeah. we'll follow up offline. Okay, I'm going to ask two very last questions, two very quick last questions now. Um, and I think uh, the first one about PR companies, I'll come to you on this, Patrick. With the rise of social media, do you think PR companies will turn their attention to social network sites and focus on gaining coverage through those channels? I think the answer to that is yes, they will. Um, I think that whole area is in such a state of flux, it's difficult to know how it's going to pan out. Um, you know, talking about being in a constant state of revolution, we've had the arrival of the term fake news 
in the last six months, you know, this time last year we wouldn't have been talking about that, we wouldn't have known anything about it. So, and, and you know, fake news, um, it, it, you know, social media is a, is, a, is a big conduit for it. So, you know, I, I think that it's very much in, in a state of play and I think we've, it's an area that needs to be looked at very closely and I think the answer is yes, but carefully, I think, is, is, is probably the way to look at that. Excellent. And uh, we'll do the final question. I think, I think Tom, you're, you're ready for an evaluation question, aren't you? And I know you like um, <laughs> cuttings questions as well. So this one wraps it all up. And this, this is a really interesting point of view. We've probably haven't got a lot of time for this answer. But the question is, in your experience, are CEOs becoming more engaged around the whole evaluation piece rather than how many cuttings are in this month's cutting book? Oh, the stud factor, my favorite topic of conversation. Uh, I, I think absolutely. I think CEOs uh, have way more way more data to consume and to get through. And I, you know, I always chuckle, uh, you know, would we ever uh, make physical hard copies of tweets uh, and put them alongside uh, a traditional uh, print pack and give that to the CEO? I think that's crazy. I think evaluation allows you to really kind of have a much better view of the entire voice, the entire uh, conversation that's out there. And uh, you know, CEOs, like everyone else, are increasingly pressed for time. Uh, and so yes, I think being able to distill it, being able to give them a purview, uh, Simple boil down graphic of the KPIs that how you're contributing to the, the organizational objectives is, is absolutely key. Yeah. Brilliant. And Patrick, I've got to get your view on this as well because you're seeing the clients, you're talking to the clients. Do you see this? Do you think that uh, CEOs are becoming more engaged around the whole evaluation piece rather than how many cuttings are in this month's cutting book? I think yes and no. I think, I think Tom's actually right. I think um, most of them are, are educated in this in this enough to know that they need to have a holistic picture of influence. Um, so absolutely. However, uh, you know, it's only a, a few short years ago where you know CEOs were extremely hung up on it. It had to be in print, and if it was digital, it didn't count. And it was you know it was ridiculous, really. But but I think we're over that now. Um, but I think yeah, I think people you know as we were saying earlier, I think senior management, C-suite people are getting very educated about this now. They're really interested in it, and they realize that it's fundamental to the success of their business or brand. Excellent. Thank you. I'm sorry. The very worst part of my job is that I've always got to cut things short. Um, thank you so much, everyone who sent in your questions. I hope you enjoyed those answers. I certainly did. And uh, I want to thank Tom and Patrick, first of all, for um, Tom for his presentation, and Tom and Patrick for so many answers, so much advice they've given there, um, and frankly, for tackling such a wide range of of questions and coverage, um, and I hope that you've all found that very useful. We will, of course, follow up. Um, as Tom said, there's a couple of questions he's going to take offline and, and, and email you the answers. Um, and of course, we're going to share the recorded webinar and the slides as well. But I'm afraid that's all we've got time for today. Um, I hope everyone enjoyed the webinar. Um, do keep your eyes peeled for the next in our Gorkana webinar series. Uh, we've got a webinar coming up on Google Analytics and how PRs can make the most of Google Analytics, and a lot more. So do keep looking at Gulkana.com. Thank you to everyone who's been able to join us for this webinar, and I hope you'll join us again soon. The webinar is now over.